In this uh, video, we're going to do a few different videos in a row. I'm going to illustrate some quantum mechanical ideas and principles with a problem called particle on a line. Okay, so it's very similar to a free particle in that the potential energy is zero, but instead of being zero for all of space, it's going to be zero only for an interval from zero to the length of the box or the line, L. Outside of this interval, the potential energy is zero, or infinity, so the particle's not even allowed to be in that region. All right, so, uh, so the particle probability of being inside the box is one, somewhere in the box. However, we don't know exactly yet what the probability distribution is. Is it a more or less uniform distribution? Is it more likely at the sides or more likely in the middle or whatever? Okay, so here's the Hamiltonian. It's minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative of x. And so let's think uh, the Schrodinger equation says, all right, we need, first of all, to find the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. And uh, if we need to make any other function that's not an eigenfunction, we can simply combine the eigenfunctions and find that. And that's actually the most useful way to do any general function. Okay, so, um, so we need to ask ourselves, the second derivative of psi must equal to a constant times psi. So that naturally leads to the question, what are functions whose second derivative is basically a constant times themselves? So here are the list. And, we see, and we, we've seen this list in the free particle as well. Cosine of dx. Okay, so if you take the derivative of the cosine, you get the minus sine. And then if you take the derivative of the minus sine, you get minus cosine. And so uh, and then, of course, you'll get k a couple of times. And so the second derivative of cosine kx is going to be minus k squared cosine of kx, which k is a constant in, in uh, this particular problem. Because k is going to be uh, defined by the... Uh, momentum of the particle, and that momentum is going to be more or less constant, except for the direction. Okay, so sometimes the particle might be moving from L to zero, and sometimes it might be from moving from zero to L. Okay, but we don't know which. But k squared is going to be the same for both of them. All right, so also sine of kx is also going to uh, obey more or less the fact that second derivative is going to be minus k squared times the original. All right, and so there's also the exponential function. Now the exponential function, the first derivative is constant times the same exponential, and so any derivative of an exponential, you're going to get constant times the exponential. So third derivative, fifth derivative, whatever. But so the second derivative. So um, when we take the derivative of e to the i kx, we're going to get i times k times the original function. And so if you do it twice, you're going to get uh, i k in parentheses squared or minus k squared. Again, it's really the same constant. This gives you minus k squared times the original. This one minus k squared times the original. This one minus k squared times the original. And one more. This is actually a different function. This is uh, the second derivative of this is also going to be minus k squared times original. So <coughs> the question becomes, which ones of these are really the most useful, okay? Um, and also obey boundary conditions. So here's where we have to actually look at our problem. So I'm going to say over here, I'm going to plot in orange the wave function, okay? So the potential at all is in pink and the x-coordinate is 0 to L. In orange, I'm going to write the wave function. All right. So now, um, psi equals 0 out here, psi equals 0 out here, and uh, I just didn't want to overlap or overwrite the, the potential energy. So, um, and there's another reason I wrote it above zero is because the first wave function actually is not z 
it does not have zero energy, it actually has a positive energy above zero. All right, so let's think about cosine. All right, so what is the shape of a cosine function? Cosine starts at 1, right, and does that. And, of course, you know, there's different frequencies, and so there's, there might be a long one and a short one, so a very short, whatever. All right, so, but we have to think about which one of these might fit in the box. Okay, and so uh, possibly half a wavelength might be something to fit in the box. But there's, there's no way to make a cosine wave, which starts at 1, match the wave function equals 0 here where the coordinate is 0. So we eliminate this as being totally unsuitable for this problem. Um, what about the sine function? Well, the sine function, sine starts at 0. So let's draw a very sine function. All right, draw a long one and a short one and a really long one. All right, so now what you can see is that certain sine functions actually do fit in here. So I'm going to put this in green, which is going to look a lot like orange to you guys. Um, so a sine function starts off at zero. And so we can make it match the wave function. So one of the conditions on a wave function is it should be continuous. And in most cases, you don't like cuss because this is one of the exceptions. Um, so the question becomes, how can we make the sine wave match over here? Okay. Well, the first one that matches over here, well, this can't match because it's still going up even. Maybe it's coming back down a little bit. I don't know, whatever. But this one where the um, sine wave, where half of the wave goes from 0 to L, that will fit in this box. Okay. All right. So that tells us something about K because... If you change k, you're going to change the, the, uh, the wave number of the wave. All right, so the lowest energy solution to this problem is where it's a half of a sine wave. So psi 1 equals uh, sine pi x over l, okay? And how do I know that? Well, first of all, sine of pi is 0. And so that's why the pi is here. Of course, x is describing how it's changing between 0 and L. And then dividing by L, so uh, that just describes um, because this half wave goes from 0 to pi. No way it goes from 0 to pi is if you're using x over L. Okay? Because when x over L, uh, when x equals L, you get sine of pi. All right, so that's the lowest energy wave function. All right, so you can plug this back in. And so this is uh, where k equals 1. All right, so, uh, all right. So what's the next one? Well, the next one you can put in is a whole sine wave. All right, and that turns out to be where k equals 2. So it's going to be the second one. It's going to be sine of 2 pi x over L. Why? Because we've done one full period of 0 to 2 pi. All right, and so uh, basically you just d keep going by multiples of pi. All right, and so what's usually done in this problem is they don't call this number k. They call it n. All right, so just for historical reasons and, and uh, just to match what textbooks do, we'll call it n pi x, and with the quantum number n. All right, so now we have found out what's the wave function for the particle of oxygen, 
the ones that are eigenfunctions. And what is the energy? Well, you basically apply, take the second derivative of the sine function. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. And we'll do it up here. Uh, let's see. M pi x over L. So it's going to be minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative of the sine function. Uh, where k is what? m plus pi over L. All right, and so um, we'll do all that, and we're going to finally find the energy. So energy times the original function sine of kx or m pi x over L, whatever you want to do, call it. Okay, so uh, what is this constant? Well, k is m pi over L. The minus signs cancel, and so we're going to get h bar squared over 2m. We're going to get uh, n squared pi squared over L squared. And so that's the energy okay? because the Hamiltonian applied to a function is equal to a constant times the function.